Hello and good afternoon, British and American culture students. As usual, we have a lot of things to talk about, um, primarily early 16th century stuff related to the Reformation. Probably the most significant thing um, that we will talk about since the Black Death um, in England, one of the most important uh, events in British history. We should say this is British history now because it, it does happen, it, it happens in Scotland as well. So I will touch on Scotland a little bit as I go. Uh, but before I do that, let's just remember this Friday is quiz number two. 46 students out of 61 managed to submit their quizzes with varying results. Uh, as I said, the scores were not that great on the first quiz, but that's kind of normal. Uh, don't get uh, too concerned. If you didn't write the quiz, you know, you're out five points. Uh, if you got a five, then you're right in the middle of the class. If you got a 10, I think one student got a 10. And um, if you got a 10, then great, good for you. Keep studying like that. Uh, anyway, Usually the scores in the quizzes start to creep up. Um, I like to see the scores be around 6.5 or 7, so we're, that's too low. So this quiz will, you might find uh, there's a, a few softball questions in this quiz um, rather than, you know, being trickier. So, but you do need to study hard and uh, already a student has asked me, uh, what's on the quiz? Well, I told you already. But I will tell you again, um, the content is chapter two, and uh, the student that emailed me claimed that she was confused uh, about what I said in one lecture or another, but as far as I know, in every lecture, I've never said anything different. Um, the stuff that's already taken care of was from chapter one. Um, Unsettling the Great Chain of Being, that's the title of chapter two, and anything within the space of chapter two is fair game. So there's, I mentioned the War of the Roses briefly. I said, you don't need to worry about that because I'm gonna add that in later. But, you know, I did tell you a little bit about Richard and Henry II and him chewing on the carpet and, um, you know, the, the shrine, uh, the shrine to Thomas Beckett uh, that was so important to medieval life and the fact that they took pilgrimages there and that Canterbury Tales was written by Chaucer. All that stuff, the Black Death, the famine, you know, the, the weather changed and there was, you know, virulent sheep and cows running around that were sick and the, the crops failed at the same time, really wet, cold weather. Um, so, you know, there was an overpopulated, um, Northern Europe was overpopulated, especially England, something around six million people and then after the famine and the Black Death ripped through the, the country a hundred years later, uh, less than half the people were remaining. And that had a big effect on demographics, the peasants' revolts. All these things were related. Um, so, you know, William the Conqueror, um, what it was like in Norman, Norman um, England, which gradually went from being a French elite to a mixed Anglo-Norman elite to basically you know, being absorbed and being English. By the 14th century, Chaucer's writing in English, right? He's still explaining things in French and, and um, Latin sometimes, but by the end of the 14th century, there's a lot less people, um, but those people, the remaining people are very, you know, culturally evolved in being English. So not that long after that, we kind of skipped the 15th century and then we're here. So basically, you wanna, you wanna study Normans, Norman England in that transformation into what we recognize more as England now um, by the end of the 14th century. And remember those dates, you know, 1453 um, is the, the end of the, the Hundred Years' War. And after that, England doesn't control France anymore. They start getting disconnected. And now you don't have English people speaking French um, fluently anymore like you, you, you had. Um, all the kings speaking French and English fluently, but gradually that's going to disappear and you're going to end up with, you know, an England that speaks English and a Scotland that speaks English and an Ireland that speaks English too. 
Okay, so that's what you need to cover for the test. Um, <clears throat> chapter three, we've already started because I talked about Henry VIII and sort of how he had a pretty dysfunctional uh, life. Um, I also said when Henry was young, he was handsome, athletic, intelligent, charismatic, and he enjoyed, he enjoyed his life. Um, he didn't really expect to be king because his older brother Arthur was the one who married Catherine of Aragon and so on. So anyway, let's just deal with the Henry thing because it's going to become really important. It's interrelated. Henry VIII, his father was Henry VII, but Henry VIII, he will get married multiple times, okay? Uh, there's six wives in total, but I'm really just going to focus on the ones that um, the, the ones that have children, essentially. Okay, so the most important the most important are the first two, Catherine of Aragon, and the second one, Anne of Boleyn. And stories are great for illustrating points, but basically the point here is <clears throat> there were already lots of checks on the king's power, so there was a, not very much room for Henry to maneuver here. Catherine had already uh, been married to his brother, and that marriage had been annulled, so it had been cancelled. So she had been remarried to Henry, and she tried to have babies, and, and it's probably due to Henry's some sort of genetic issue or or infection of some sort some people think um, he was had various types of diseases by the time he was older at least um, but at this, at this point he's pretty young so you know she gets pregnant many times and she loses babies boys and girls some two uh, baby boys are born uh, and one of the one of them dies several months later and one of them dies like two weeks later so it's very Obviously, it's even more stressful than usual because everybody in the kingdom is hoping that he's going to have a boy. And so even, <clears throat> so when he has a girl, he's like, oh, that's, that's fine. I got a girl. It's, and the next time it'll be a boy. <clears throat> but there was never any others. So the baby girl who's born in the string of failed pregnancies and and you know miscarriages. Her name is Mary, okay? And so she's half Spanish, right? Because her mother's a Spanish princess. Um, <clears throat> so Mary is born, but Catherine is getting older. It seems pretty obvious that they're not gonna be able to have children anymore. So the natural solution would be maybe wait a little bit or like have her retire to a nunnery or something like that. But Catherine's a pretty proud woman and she's been pretty understanding of Henry's behavior. He's had lots of girlfriends. He's partied all the time. She's supported him when he's off fighting wars in, in um, France to try and take back land that belonged to his ancestors. She's pretty much, you know, supporting all the things that he does and not interfering with his life. But when he decides that he wants to get married and have another queen and push her into the background, she's not willing to do that. Uh, and she's strong enough, independent woman to refuse. And she's not particularly pop popular, but she has the respect of English people. Like she is a um, responsible, dutiful queen. She does her duty and, and um, she follows the rules of, you know, um, English upper class manners and court decorum. She does everything she's supposed to do. The only thing is she doesn't have a boy. So I wouldn't say Henry um, loves her because Henry's not that, I mean, he's says, he says that he loves her sometimes and it seems like he might love her, but he changes his mind. He's very mercurial. His emotions and passions cool and heat up like, he very easily, you know, condemns people to death um, that he seems to really respect before. But anyway, he does care for his wife, 
Um, and the, the only solution to this uh, really is for her to, you know, the, her, the whole thing, him to disavow his, his daughter and his wife and for her not to be queen anymore. She doesn't want to do that. So the only thing that he can do is get a divorce. So he tries to get a divorce from the Pope. But the Pope says, no, you can't have a divorce. Um, Catherine's, Catherine's relatives are in very powerful positions in the Holy Roman Empire in Germany, in Austria, and on the other side of Italy, um, in Spain. And they're, they're the, they are the supporters of the Catholic Church. The Pope needs the support of these great kings of big kingdoms. England is not a big kingdom at this point. Spain is much, much more powerful. Not, it's not even close. Um, same thing with the Holy Roman Empire and France. These kingdoms are getting larger and more powerful, and England is getting weaker. So Henry doesn't have any ability to pressure the Pope, even though when he was young and he condemned Martin Luther for his reformation, for trying to change the church, um, the, one of the popes actually gave him the title Defend of, Defender of the Faith. Henry VIII, Defender of the Faith, which means Defender of Christianity. And he writes a document, he writes an argument like an essay, uh, condemning Martin Luther and the Reformation and supporting the Pope. This is Henry, the same guy. But now he wants a divorce and the Pope won't give it to him. So this is the trigger for him to say, you know what? I don't like listening to anyone anyway. I don't like listening to anyone ever. So this Pope can't tell me what to do. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the English law and make the English church under the power of, of the government, under my power instead. I'm gonna make myself the head of the church. So this <clears throat> act of supremacy will create an English church. So first, what he does is he consolidates his authority and his power, and he, he has control. He has control. He has ministers that are loyal, uh, and he has a parliament that basically is scared of him, and I would be too. He, he is a scary guy. He's a tyrant. Um, he's going to legally form an empire, okay? So in a sense... This is the beginning of the British Empire. If you want to make, you can make arguments about whatever, wherever it starts. Queen Elizabeth, 1707, you can talk about Cromwell and the Commonwealth. We'll talk about all these things. But in the language of the Act of, Act of Supremacy, he does say we have in, um, imperial authority over ourselves. No other foreign power can control us. This is the empire of the English. Okay, so he creates an empire in which he has imperium, which is a Roman word for I have sovereignty over myself. No other uh, power can have power over me. I have power over other things. Nothing has power over me. I'm at the top of the imperial system, which means the Pope is not. The Pope has no authority. He's removed the authority of, of the Pope over any part of the church in England. So this is essentially the legal death of the English church. But the Catholic church in England will survive. Uh, it'll survive until now, uh, but it'll survive a hundred years longer, you know, in some shape or form, and then get sort of crushed into, you know, a small group of underground Catholics. And then today there are Catholic churches in England and they're allowed to practice, but essentially um, over the decades, the, the um, Catholic Church of England will become illegal and it'll be illegal to go to the Catholic Church um, and this is what Henry VIII starts okay and the, the trigger point is I need a divorce so he gets the divorce because now he's created a new church and he's the head of the church so he gives himself a divorce so I mean before that they do have a trial and they try to do it through the Catholic Church the Catholic Church stalls and then they reject it and Catherine is part of it it's a very sad scene, of course, her saying that she won't meet, step down and she won't accept the divorce. And then the Pope, you know, basically saying, well, you can't. 
<clears throat> so his solution is to do that. So that's it. That frees him up. Meanwhile, in the background of this whole thing, of course, Henry VIII, being the person he is, he's already fallen in love with somebody else. That's somebody else who will be Queen Anne. Okay? And Queen Anne is a Protestant. Okay? She's not the type of Protestant that Henry likes, actually, though, as he will find out. He actually likes the Catholic Church. He just wants to be in control. This is the confusing thing about Henry. So please remember this, because this will definitely be on the test and a quiz in some form. Is, is Henry VIII a Catholic or a Protestant? Well, obviously he's a Protestant because he, got, he left the Catholic Church. He broke away from, that's Protestant protest. He's protesting, that's the way he did it. He became the head of the Catholic Church in England and renamed it the Church of England. So he's, he is a Protestant, but ideologically he's not. He still burns candles. He still wants masses done. Everything he does for the rest of his life. He's, he grew up a Catholic. He believes he's going to hell if he doesn't pray and use candles and go to mass. And when he dies, he's going to want people to say, he's going to donate money and say, you've got to say mass for me, you know, 1,000 times so that my soul can go to heaven. All these practices that are um, at the core of Catholic belief, he retains. He never gives them up. But this is the thing. Once there's already a reformation in Germany, there's already a reformation in the Netherlands. It's spreading all over the place. These ideas, they sort of become contagious. Once you, once you argue against the, you know, the sanctity and the power of the Catholic Church and you, know, you reject um, the, the uh, <clears throat> rules, you break the rules and you reject the influence and the, the right of the Catholic Church to interpret the Bible for you. Once you've done all those things, it's kind of like, like opening a can of worms. You just can't get them back in. These ideas just keep, keep falling out all over the place. And um, yeah, the, the church, the Catholic church was uh, in control of many parts of society, right? I mentioned this before, in the medieval period, they did the social services, like they did education, they supported orphanages, they took donations, they, they grew food, they did training, they did counseling, they were in everything. They were judges, right? Teachers, judges, philosophers, scribes, interpreters, you know, <clears throat> spiritual leaders. They did all kinds of different functions um, for, for the, the lay people, for the people, for the English um, citizens, um, the peasants, and all the way up to, you know, the king. So this starts to, this order that has been created, the chain of being, and it's sustained by the Catholic Church. Henry wants that, but he's introduced this system, this idea that works against it. This is why kings and queens will still want to be Catholic, even though they're the Church of England. They want the Church of England to be just like the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church is a, is a hierarchy. It, it mirrors the society, right? English society is... Uh, a big chain with a few people at the top that are very important, chosen by God, all the way down to the masses of normal people at the bottom. And that's what the Catholic Church is. They, they're perfectly matched to each other. The Protestant ideas will match, be much easier to match or reconcile with, you know, Republican ideas or democracy. Because in, in most of the Reformed churches, there will be councils, right? There'll be groups of people that form and they will do the governing. There won't be one single, you know, chosen person uh, elected by God and chosen by, you know, cardinals in a special ceremony to be the leader of the Catholic Church until his death. I mean, the Pope is a prince. He's a religious king. They're all kind of like that. So then when you have a, a king of England, I mean, he's obviously going to like the idea, the Catholic ideas most, because that's it supports his worldview, and Protestant, Protestant Protestantism doesn't, in fact. So most of the monarchies in Europe um, that remain, you know, until the French Revolution and beyond, there's a lot of them are Catholic. The French remain Catholic. 
the Spanish and Portuguese and the Italians. Um, they have princes, they don't have kings as much, but all of the great monarchies um, in Europe will remain, um, they will remain Catholic because it's easier for them to maintain their authority. Okay, so let's um, take a look here. This is, again, this is a recording, but this is like, uh, you know, live teaching, kind of. <clears throat> Trying to simulate the classroom here. So if I walk around or disappear, we're just going to keep going. So in the book there, <clears throat> right away, like I said, I started talking about Henry a lot. And you do need to read about Henry. Don't forget. I, I can't just, I could talk about Henry for an hour, but that would be a long lecture and most of you would probably be tired of it. <clears throat> He's going to... Henry's going to get tired of Anne pretty quickly. She's too Protestant, and she ends up having a daughter, Elizabeth. And um, he gets so frustrated with Anne um, that he decides to kill her. People don't really know exactly the reason, but basically they frame her, as far as I'm concerned. She flirts with a couple of guys and says, makes jokes about Henry VIII, like not being very good in bed, like he's not good at having sex. Um, and, you know, they just, this is how dangerous Henry is. He doesn't want, he wants to get rid of her because she just gave him a daughter and they're not getting along and she's too Protestant and he doesn't like it. Um, so basically he makes up an excuse. Oh, you, you insulted me. Um, you're cheating on me with, you know, this, this musician and, or this, this nobleman. And they torture the guys and they get them to say, yes, the, the queen, you know, tried to have sex with me or I had sex with the queen. And they get these, uh, they get these confessions. And um, so she goes to trial and she probably didn't do anything that serious. She just um, wasn't careful about what she said, um, insulting her husband. And that was dangerous enough that he used it as an excuse uh, to have her executed, right? <clears throat> Catherine dies, naturally, just naturally, like, she just gets sick and dies, <clears throat> and gets executed, and then Jane Seymour is his next beautiful young woman, uh, he falls in love with her, and, you know, um, she becomes queen, and he gets a boy named Edward, and unfortunately, uh, Jane Seymour dies uh, when Edward is born, she dies. <clears throat> so she's gone too. Um, sick, executed, and dies in pregnancy. Uh, and then there's three more. There's three more after that. Um, there's another Catherine. <clears throat> um, there's, there's two more Catherines, I think. And another Anne. Anyway, one of them, kind of, he gets married and he cancels it. And then his last... His last uh, his sixth wife just kind of takes care of him. Um, Catherine Howard, she just kind of cheats on him and goes crazy, and then she gets in big trouble too. But we'll just say, although there are six, you should know there are six wives total, we'll just try and remember the first three. That's what I, I do too. Um, don't worry about the details for the other queens. They are most important because these are the three children, right? And we'll have to talk about this when we get to Elizabeth stuff next time. But, <clears throat> suffice to say, Mary is half Spanish. She grows up Catholic. Elizabeth grows up, <clears throat> she's a woman. They're not focusing on her. She, he grows up, she grows up basically Protestant, but pretty much in between, right? Pretty moderately, she's a moderate Protestant. And then we got <clears throat> Edward as a, uh, very Protestant. And that's because his mother's family is very Protestant and they basically have control over him and his education as uh, Henry gets older and sicker and cares less about, you know, mundane details like children's education. Okay, so now let's, let's go to the, the meat of the lecture which is concerned with the Reformation. Um, <clears throat> so what is the Reformation? Uh, it is a movement that was triggered by Martin Luther, um, but he certainly wasn't the original 
reformer. There was lots of people who tried to reform and the, the um, Catholics had name for that. It's, a, it's called heresy. Right? So just like the Lollards, and that's why we talked about John Wycliffe, because he was an Oxford educated, you know, English priest. And uh, he thought that we should have an English Bible and then we should be able to teach things, right? Um, and we should interpret the Bible for ourselves. And he thought the church land should be repossessed by the public and redistributed because the church was corrupt and too wealthy. These are very similar ideas to Martin Luther. Um, <clears throat> but basically, Martin Luther was in the right place at the right time. And probably, I can just imagine him you know, having, to, he apparently loved to drink. So maybe he had too many beers one night and he was just raging about all the, all the problems in the Catholic church. And he's like, no, what? I'm going to write all of these ideas in a huge list and I'm going to nail them to the front of the church. <clears throat> and everybody that's drinking with him is like, no, don't do it, Martin. Don't do it. Just go home and go to bed. And he's like, no, I'm going to do it. And then he goes over there and he, he nails it there. And the next morning he wakes up late He's like, oh man, I gotta go do go to the church and do my stuff and you know <clears throat> study and and pray and 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 then do all my duties. And then he's like, oh, what, what did I do last night? Oh yeah, oh my God, I put that I put that letter on the church door, and it's too late. Everybody's seen it. <laughs> and what the what the Catholic Church would do to people like that is they would call them for a trial and investigate them. If you were in Spain, you would be visited by somebody called an inquisitor. There's a Spanish inquisition and they, they go around searching their kind of investigators. They ser search around for people spreading, you know, um, counter Catholic ideas of any kind, any religion that's not Catholic, any, anything that's against any propaganda or messages against the Catholic church. And they, they torture them and they kill them. So, you know, the, the punishment for a heretic is burning to death. So, <clears throat> You know, the, the Catholic Church says, okay, Martin Luther, come here. You're one of our priests. You got to come to Rome and have a trial. And he's like, I don't think I'm going to do that because I know what's going to happen. You're going to give me a fake trial. You're going to decide that I'm a heretic. Then you're going to burn me in front of everybody and say, this is what happens when you write down your ideas and you, you nail them to a church door. You burn, um, you know, in a bonfire like Martin Luther. <clears throat> so he gets sheltered by some princes and and the wealthy people in Germany uh, and then there's a you know as a consequence there's a devastating war uh, we call the 30 years war which basically you know it's Catholics against Protestants and France against Germany and Germany against itself and the Holy Roman Empire is in there and the Spanish are in there and they just it's it's like it's like one of the one of the world wars you know like more like Napoleon than like World War one where, or, or more like um, World War II, where all of Europe gets completely destroyed and there's millions and millions of people who die of starvation and death and disease uh, while these wars of religion, primarily Christians against themselves, are happening. It's called the Thirty Years' War. And it, get, it gets, um, you know, kicked off by, by these tensions between different countries and excuses over religion and and uh, interpretation and practice and, and power, right? England is not involved in this. So this, you know, spares England a lot of damage that especially Germany suffers. They, they say, you know, it took 100 years for Germany or 200 years for Germany to recover from this damage. So that's the, the short, super short history of the Reformation. It, it starts in a totally different way in England because, I mean, everybody doesn't, everybody kind of, you know, there's some resistance and some people are burned and some people are thrown in jail and some people are killed. Like Sir Thomas More, um, the great writer who wrote Utopia, was also the Lord Chancellor and a famous lawyer and a philosopher and uh, well respected on the continent. And when he refused to change his religion from Catholic to Protestant, Henry VIII had him killed. Even though they were pretty close and he was an important person, um, he was executed for treason because he wouldn't, um, <clears throat> he wouldn't take the oath of, of, of fealty to the king as the head of the Catholic Church because he said, I'm Catholic, I can't do that. 
And so Henry said, then off with your head. <clears throat> so what does it mean to be Catholic <clears throat> versus Protestant? It's much more difficult to talk about Protestants because there's so many different types of Protestants. So we'll talk about Catholic first. So basically Catholic is the traditional re uh, religion, the Christian religion, the original one. And, and Protestant is a break off religion that it breaks off into many different parts and it keeps splitting because they can't agree with each other. Part of, a, part of the attraction and the, the advantage and the disadvantage of the Catholic Church is that it has one set of rules, it has one Pope, and like all the authority is from one place. So there's not gonna be as much friction between different versions. Uh, but at the same time, you know, Catholic religion has also adapted so much. You know, the Catholic Church in Sweden, the Catholic Church in England and Spain and Italy, you know, they're not the same. Poland, they're not the same. They've, they've, even in towns, they have their own saints, they have their own sort of customized rituals and everything. Um, so the Catholic Church is really <clears throat> a big kind of, you know, encompassing um, theology that absorbs things into it. But basically, you got, there's fundamental things you gotta follow. And if you don't, then, yeah, you're, this is a heresy. There's a, it happens periodically. It doesn't happen very often in England, just basically Wycliffe and the Lollards. Other than that, England doesn't really have heresies, but there's heresies all over the place. Arian heresies, um, the Coptic, you know, church in Egypt, is it really, um, you know, part of the Christian church? And even, you know, Eastern Orthodox, Greek and Russian Orthodox and Serbian Orthodox, are those, you know, legitimate? At some point, the Catholic church, you know, breaks with them and says, you're not the Christian church, we are, okay? So this has happened many times before. Um, the Great Schism is the name of the section, but that's really not a good name because there's more than one Great Schism. Even during the Hundred Years' War, uh, there's two popes at one point, there's one in France and one in Italy, and like the, the Catholic Church almost rips in half, partly because, as I told you, so many priests that were well-trained and good uh, people died and they were replaced by selfish, untrained, um, uncommitted, less enthusiastic people. And that the, the church, the reputation of the church went down because the quality of their, their staff, um, of their priests and nuns and abbots and all of their representatives uh, declined. So what are the core ideas of Catholicism? <clears throat> it's easy to kind of just everything the Catholics say the Protestants are against, protesting against. So we got, you know, there's a Pope, a strict hierarchy with the Pope at its head. Um, Anglican, the Anglican Church, that's Protestant, does have the king at the head of the church. So, so Anglican is kind of a hybrid, but basically work with me here. These are the basic things, okay? So there's a Pope. Catholic Church is a Pope. Other places don't have the Pope. There's ceremonies that are elaborate. There's celebrations and festivals, including, you know, you know, drinking church ale after church on Sunday, which Protestants don't do that. If Protestants drink, they drink in moderation. Uh, they don't, don't just, you know, get drunk Sunday afternoon right after church. Not that all Catholic church, not that all Catholics do that, but I mean, they could do that. They could indulge and that's fine. Uh, for some churches in Catholic Church, but generally frowned upon by any Protestant church. They have decorative sanctuaries, ornate sculptures and stained glass windows. They're beautiful, it's artistic. And mostly, you know, Protestant churches are plain. They worship saints and the Virgin Mary, not just God and Jesus. The only Bible permitted and available is the Latin translated from the Greek, the Vulgate, it's called. Um, the scriptures can only be interpreted by ordains clergy. You can't figure out what the Bible means by yourself, unless you're specially trained by the Catholic Church. So, in contrast, all of these different versions, and they are different, the Protestants, and we'll talk about that later, um, but this is the these are the basic characteristics, core ideas of Protestant churches. Church is governed by a seminary, which they said, a group, and they have an elected leader, some kind of moderator, various types, but some kind of group some kind of council. Um, there's an infinite emphasis placed on single worship service, simple worship services rather, 
So simpler is better. Just focus on the Bible and the words and the message, not the atmosphere or the architecture or whatever. Thus, sanctuaries are built to be plain and functional. Worship of false idols is forbidden uh, because that's you can't do that in the Old Testament. That's one of their main things. You can't worship a saint. You can't um, take a figurine of the Virgin Mary and then pray to that and put candles around it. That's wrong. Anyone is entitled to interpret the Word of God, and the Bible can be written in your local regional language called a vernacular. So the vernacular in England would be English, and the vernacular in uh, Netherlands would be Dutch, and they create Bibles in their own language. Yeah, <clears throat> so it goes on. That's This is at the beginning of the chapter. We're talking about pages, you know, 93 forward. You need to read all these pages over to get fill in the gaps that I'm not telling you the complete story. I'm just kind of giving you the rundown of the most important parts. So take a look at what it says. It says one type, and I want to explain this one right now, um, Puritanism, what we call Puritans. I'm going <clears> to <throat> discuss this quick because um, these, these people are not um, popular or powerful yet, but they represent sort of the radical Protestant side. If you look at this as a continuum, and you've got super Catholic Spanish Inquisition over here, like, if you don't do exactly what we say, we're going to find you, torture you, and kill you. That's the radical um, <clears throat> Roman Catholic side. On the other side, you've got, of course, you've got radical Protestants, which the Puritans, to a certain extent, fall on that side of the scale. There's a and, and the basically, I would say, one way of characterizing the Anglican Church is that it's half and half. It's a mixture of Protestant and Catholic. So um, the best description I've ever heard is by a histor history professor. I'm not certain at the moment who it was, but what he did is he said, uh, Anglican is um, a religion that looks Catholic and thinks Protestant. Okay, so the ideas of the Church of the Church of England are Protestant, but on the outside they have bishops hats, they have people called bishops, and they have candles and sanctuaries and everything like that, but <clears throat> um, the ideas that they follow, the English Bible, the interpretation, right? Priests are allowed to marry, the flexibility of of worship styles is Protestant, not Catholic. Okay. So Puritanism is basically this English radical Protestantism. Uh, being, being called a Puritan was not a compliment. It means pure. Pure sounds like a good thing, but actually it meant like too pure. It, it meant that you've gone too far and that you're obsessed and you're like a crazy person that's obsessed with purity in an unhealthy way. So they basically just stripped everything down, everything that I said, you know, no work on Sunday, you know, uh, mosaic law. So, you know, if you're cheating on your husband or, or your, your wife, basically you should be put to death, right? Uh, these, are, these are really harsh punishments and very strict schedules that it's not really <clears throat> in the Catholic, you know, interest to, to follow um, everything strictly like that. They're not literally, you know, following what the Bible says, but um, they, the Puritans try to focus on only the literal, you know, meaning of the Bible and then throw everything else out the window. All the ceremonial stuff and everything, and, and the, they end up being actually very, very committed, almost like, you know, fanatical. So the, the thing is there's not as many of them because it's a very hard lifestyle. And you do have to be kind of really zoned in on, <clears throat> on your religious purpose and committed to what you believe. And this fanaticism, it, may, it turns out that they were really good soldiers, for one thing. Because when they fight, they, they don't run away and they don't give up. They, they believe that this is what they need to do. If they're fighting, then they're fighting for Jesus. They're fighting for their religion and their life. And that's what they're supposed to do. So they... they even if they're um, scared, even if they're intimidated, um, they made very good soldiers. They have very high morale 
and they, they worked really hard. But <clears throat> I, I had this um, quote, I don't know if I actually put it in the textbook, but I read this quote, you know, that some people define Puritanism as the fear that someone somewhere is having a good time, right? So there's no, there's no like parties or drinking or celebration or singing or, or laughing and playing and free time. It's just work, sleep, pray, right? Eat, sleep, work, pray. Like just reduce your life down to that. Most of us like to have a little bit of fun sometimes, but no fun. Sit on a bench and listen to the Bible. That's not fun. You can tell the Bible in an interesting way. Bible stories can be interesting, um, but that's not an easy, that's not an interesting way to do it, right? To drill it into your head, like you're memorizing, you know, Moby Dick word by word. It, Moby Dick wouldn't be an interesting book to read if you had to memorize it and there was a test every Sunday on every, you know, three pages that you read. But this is the approach they took to life. Um, when the Puritans take over in the English Civil War in the 17th century, we'll talk about that later too, they cancel Christmas. And you can't imagine England without Christmas and Queen Victoria and Prince Albert hanging up the decorations on the, on the Christmas tree that they brought from Germany. Um, or Santa Claus and his, his Coca-Cola and his Yo-Ho and, and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer stuff. That's Western stuff, isn't it? Why would you cancel Christmas? That's what they did. The Puritans tried to cancel. When they were in control of England, they tried to cancel Christmas. And when they moved to Massachusetts in America, they didn't celebrate Christmas. Yeah, so there you go. That bring us, brings us up. I mentioned Sir Thomas More there um, on page 100 and 101. You can look him over because I mentioned him, but look at the details of what he represented. And right there is where we'll stop for today because... I'm going to talk about Elizabeth and her brother and her sister uh, next class and we'll get closer to our, you know, modern age when we start to talk about Shakespeare and Parliament and, uh, you know, moving into 17th century England. So, thank you very much for listening. Please don't forget, 10 o'clock this Friday, same deal, Google Forms, link through the cyber, cyber campus. CNU portal. Don't be late and technical issues is not an excuse. So be ready to use it on a device, whether it's your phone or your computer and make sure you hand it in on time so that you can get a score. Thank you for listening and uh, see you on Friday.